Hello and welcome to today's webinar. I'm your host, Matthew Stevens. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping details for attendees. This webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive a link to the recording by email soon after the webinar. All attendees are currently on mute. So if you'd like to ask a question during the webinar, please use the questions module on the sidebar of your screen. Your questions and comments are only seen by today's presenters and we've reserved some time at the end of the webinar to run through them. Following the webinar, if you'd like to access more learning opportunities, please check out Sendine Resource Library on sendine.com. I'm delighted to introduce our speakers today. Firstly, Nikki Graham, VP Marketing at Sendine. Nikki leads the global marketing team to drive demand generation, brand awareness, and maintain presence for Sendine as the leading CRM sales and revenue strategy provider for the hospitality industry. Our second presenter today is Robert Schimmel, a Vice President of Product Management. Robert oversees the development strategy of Sendine's hospitality products. Robert is responsible for balancing Sendine's innovation schedule to successfully and consistently create the next generation of products. With over 10 years at Sendine, Robert has grown with the company from coder to executive. As mentioned, I'm Matthew Stevens. I'm the Managing Director at eHotelier, and I love combining my hotel management and IT experience to develop the most extensive educational e-learning library to support current and aspiring hotel professionals around the globe. At Sendine, the mission is to drive marketing, sales and revenue performance for the travel and hospitality industry through innovative software and services that remove the friction from the traveler's journey. Today, we'll be exploring the impact and the opportunities created by Apple's new privacy changes. We'll be learning why measuring email activity is important, what you need to know about Apple's privacy changes, and how we can improve and measure email engagement in a private world. I'm delighted now to hand over to Nikki Graham from Sendine to begin the presentation. Over to you, Nikki. Great, thank you, Matthew. Welcome, everyone. Great to be here. So first of all, before we get started, I think we want to have a look at why email marketing and measuring email marketing specifically is so important. Really, it's our massive opportunity to learn about our subscriber behavior. We want to understand kind of how campaign performs, how, what their overall performance targets should look like, and also understand how engaged your audience is. If you know your audience, then you know your subscriber base, and ultimately you can continue to improve and develop um, your campaigns over time. And why we're here today. So privacy is trending at the moment, as we all know. It seems to be a buzzword that we're all hearing about. And that's really because data is at the cornerstone of everything we do nowadays. Um, in a more private world, when it comes to it, data may, um, is, is safer then. As we scale the usage of data across the globe, these privacy frameworks are in place to protect us as consumers. And as we all know, back in 2018, GDPR was one of the first thing that really kind of ricocheted us into this new world. And CCPA then soon followed in the US. And those were some of the big changes that first came about. We're now seeing Apple really at the forefront of privacy as they've made changes to their Safari browser, um, and now obviously this male privacy protection that we'll talk about in more detail. Google will also soon follow in 2023 with their changes to the third party cookies. So a lot is changing. I'll now pass over to Robert, who can give us a little bit more detail about what all these Apple privacy changes are. Excellent, thank you, Nikki. Uh, Happy to happy to be here and uh, join you in this uh, great webinar today. So uh, quickly, Apple's Mail Privacy Protection, or MPP for short, uh, has been around for just over a month now and affects the most recent version of their operating systems. Those who have installed these updates will be prompted to opt in to the new privacy protection features. And once they're enabled, uh, email marketers will no longer be able to accurately rely on the open rate metrics that have been you know, a major indicator uh, through the years. Essentially, Apple is creating a proxy to silently open the emails on the user's behalf and masking the IP address, the device type, the timestamp, the location, et cetera, so that it can't be linked back uh, while measuring uh, their user's activity on the web. 
On the next slide, I'll uh, be able to show you a visual about exactly how this will work. <clears throat> so prior to the privacy protection enhancement, uh, if you follow this line down from the incoming mail and down through email, uh, email arrives to subscribers Apple mailbox, all the way down, status don't, uh, the status don't protect mail activity had been the um, this the way that email had worked on Apple, you know, since the inception. And really, there was no proxy. There was no middle mayor, middleman in the in the middle um, getting involved with the email at all. It would just land in the user's inbox, and all of those metrics would flow back to the marketers. Now. However, this has changed with the MPP flag. So when this is enabled, which is the top line, uh, it is sent through the proxy where the data is pre-cached, pre-loaded, anonymized, and then whether or not the user even opened the email, data is sent back to the marketers, which falsely skews the data in a more positive direction. <clears throat> so now let's talk about some ways that we can overcome these false opens. Some email uh, sending tools have the ability to identify emails uh, that have the mail privacy protection enabled. So the, the users have that have enabled this setting, we can determine that they uh, opened or the email was opened on their behalf uh, through some algorithms. Uh, this will allow the sender to isolate these recipients from the rest of the population to help gauge the success of the campaigns amongst the other non-mail privacy protection recipients. In a few minutes, Nikki will go over uh, some of the other strategic criteria to measuring campaign success outside of just the open rate. <clears throat> slide. So you may be asking yourself whether the open rate is dead. Uh, the answer really is it's not yet. As email marketers, you definitely will see a hike in your deliverability numbers as a result of these new privacy, uh, privacy settings. There is still plenty of data to leverage from non-Apple users. However, the state of privacy at the moment, we know uh, we need to prepare for um, the, to rely less on the open rate, essentially. Um, that is going to be you know, skewed uh, for more favorably to the openers uh, in the future as more and more systems adopt these this this type of approach. So this is a perfect segue uh, into the next part of this uh, presentation where Nikki will bring you through the eight ways you can stay relevant in a private world. Thank you, Nikki, on to you. Great, thanks, Robert. So how do we improve and measure email engagement in this private world? So I think, first of all, we'll start off by looking at our um, click-through rate. And click-through rate has often been a bit of an afterthought in the marketing world. With often quite low numbers through your campaigns, marketers tend to focus or have in the past on opens, as that can in turn translate into views, into um, offers and search forth on the website. But I think click-through rate now, as we can see, is about to have its heyday. Looking at the click-through rate of your emails enables you to have a better understanding of your subscriber behavior. You can learn more about what offers are making your subscribers click and then also what's not. This information allows you to tweak your offers or your emails based on the audience you're sending to. Ultimately, a more personalized, um, simple campaign can um, see more effective and higher click-through rates. So start have a, having a think about your call to actions, those buttons in your emails, and determine are they really compelling enough for your audience to click. Next up is looking at that booking conversion rate. And this may be something that you're not doing yet or you're starting to dabble in. But in our industry, it's not really enough just to look at email opens and clicks. We must also see how that converts as well. So a booking conversion rate allows you to see how well your emails are performing in generating actual demand for your hotel. If, for example, you can see that one offer has a low click-through rate, but a high booking conversion, you know that that pathway after they've clicked on the email to the conversion is working really well. However, 
because your click through rate is low, perhaps there could be more that you can do with the call to action on your email to drive more people to that. Perhaps even your audience is maybe not as targeted as it should be. And quite a few of those people perhaps found that click through rate not that compelling. So again, looking at the call to action here, so that click through can really help improve your booking conversions as well as click through rates in driving people through the email to the offer page that you want to get them to. So with um, both of those uh, metrics, both click-through rate and booking conversion, A-B testing is key. And one thing that we tell our customers all the time is to test, test, test. If you aren't testing, you just can't improve. For both click-through rate and booking conversions, it's a great way to continue to tweak um, different aspects of your email. For example, you can test call to actions, you can test images, you can test headlines, or even the first sentence of your body copy if you really want to finesse the messaging in your email. But the key is to pick one variable and test that within each campaign. Don't try and mix and match as it will be impossible to then see what change caused this change in behavior that you're, you're measuring. And with this change from the male protection privacy, privacy protection, um, you can start looking more at A-B testing variables that are measured on click-through rate instead of open. A lot of us, a lot of marketers in the past, tend to always go from the open because you start to see results faster because an open rate happens quicker. But if you're measuring click-through rate instead, you can give wider berth, you can have a longer period of time to measure the success of that email and um, start looking at how people actually engage with your emails instead of just waiting for them to open. This will also mean that your results won't be skewed if you are relying on open rate for your A-B testing, just while these this MPP has been um, brought into play. So next up is another one that is often missed, is measuring list growth. So how frequently you actually are you actually looking at how many people are added to your subscriber list or audience? If you're seeing your audience numbers go down, this could actually mean you're getting a lot of unsubscribes. And if this is the case, I would really urge you to take a minute to review all of your communications and your list sources, because a high subscribe unsubscribe rate could mean that your emails aren't resonating with your audience and the cadence of sending could be too frequent as well. But for example, if you see that your lists are static, you could, and not moving in too much of any direction, you could perhaps have a look at your website and see how you can improve your subscriber opt-in process. Perhaps you might want to tempt them with a loyalty program or bespoke offers to get them to opt-in. Ultimately, measuring list growth is a really great way for you to understand how your emails are resonating with your audience. So your website, when it comes to that, enhancing how you capture email addresses is key. Again, a list is not something that you want to stay static for a long time. You want to continue to grow that and build on it. And this can really help boost your numbers um, if you're adding people to your subscriber database, regardless of whether they've booked or not. Enhancing your website visibility allows you to showcase the property and amenities, as well as give offers that can entice people to sign up or perhaps join your loyalty program. Another benefit is also improving search engine optimization. It's something that we're always all trying to strive to achieve, and this is a great way to do it if you're making sure that the offers and landing pages you have on your website are uh, updated regularly and reflect accurate information tied to your property. And that's another great way to just make sure that you're getting those new emails coming in. Next, we have automations. So some may be using things such as customer journeys or uh, email automation to help tick along your email campaigns so that they're, they run without having to manually keep updating them every week or every few days. So if you are running, aren't running any automations, I would strongly urge you to have a look at the, the um, trigger that is relied upon these, for these automations. If they are based on email opens, you may, over the past few weeks, have started to see more people run through those automations because 
it, your system will think more people are opening them. Um, so it could be a good opportunity for you to look at changing that variable within the automation to switch it to looking at click-through rate. So you might then be able to just give a refresh to your campaigns. Again, if you're re-looking at your call to actions in those emails um, and the offers, maybe changing out some of the images, that might help drive some of the conversions for click-through rate as well. And again, give a refresh to your automations that are running in the background. Next, we get on to CRM. So um, for all of these tactics, having a CRM or a data platform at the heart of what you're doing will really help you execute and improve your email marketing tactics. Because the more data you pull in, as you can see from the left, and the, um, the better you can get at streamlining communications to the right, and then leveraging that information across any application that you use at your hotel. And this really enhances how you can personalize the communication. Um, and, and make sure that that information is relevant to the um, reader or subscriber of your emails. Ultimately, this can all drive demand across your big business, regardless of the solutions you're using. And finally, as I've kind of mentioned throughout all of these tactics, being personalized is really, really critical. The more information you have on your guests and the more subscribers you have, the smarter you can get with your email campaigns. So leverage the information you have in your CRM or data platform to refine those email marketing messages like we talked about, finesse the call to actions and improve the offer pages on your website. All of these small changes can make a dramatic difference as we look to shift away from open rate. Because the more personalized you get with the comms, the more relevant they are to the reader and ultimately the more conversions you'll start to see. So really our key takeaways from this presentation, firstly is that email and other engagement channels are changing. These privacy updates are the changes that we've needed to continue to evolve and refine our communication strategies to subscribers. Make sure you prioritize your first party data and use that to tailor all of your communications. Be relevant, targeted and smart with those communications because engagement is really hard to come by now there's a lot of noise out there so make your offer count okay thank you very much nikki thank you robert uh, that was a very insightful presentation and hopefully helped to clear up what these apple privacy changes are actually meaning for hotels and where we go from here we've got a few questions we'd like to ask uh, both robert and nikki um, Perhaps we'll start with uh, Robert. How do these changes affect non-Apple mail users and their data? Sorry about that. Uh, great question. Uh, the short answer right now, they really don't. If you're not using uh, Apple Mail, uh, then uh, the, the numbers will continue to flow into the marketers um, as they always were. Uh, the Apple Mail, again, if you are able to identify the, the messages that have come in through Apple Mail, um, those, those can be pushed aside and you can measure the campaign success through the other, um, the other mail carriers. Now, one thing I, I think needs to be mentioned is that through Apple Mail, you can run other email syst uh, systems through it. For example, if you have a Gmail account, and it's set up through your Apple Mail, um, that would take advantage of the new privacy settings. So if you're using the Gmail app, for example, on your iPhone, then it won't, then it will be, uh, your open rates will, will still count. But if you're using Apple Mail to load your Gmail or Hotmail or AOL or whatever other email carrier you're using, you are still protected. So that's uh, it's very important to note that. Um, but you'd still be able to be identified through a lot of the mail uh, from a marketing standpoint as somebody who uh, had the proxy open the email. So again, it's not the greatest uh, situation, uh, but you can, if you're able to, identify the Apple Mail users and kind of put put those that data aside and really use the the rest of the community to gauge. Um, gauge open rate and the success of the campaign, at least for now. <laughs> sure. Thank you. 
Uh, we've got another couple of questions here. If you have any questions, feel, please feel free to put them in the chat. If we don't get round to everybody, we'll uh, respond to them by email. Um, Robert, probably another one for you. Uh, do you foresee other email marketing providers and applications following suit, following Apple's trend? Yeah, I mean, typically that's the case um, when you have measures like this. Um, oftentimes there's an early adopter community and they'll see success and they'll be looked at uh, protecting their users first and foremost. And then, yeah, uh, typically others will follow. Uh, it will be interesting, though. It will be interesting to see, you know, ultimately how the users continue to adopt this feature. Because, again, um, there are benefits for uh, for marketers to know that the user is opening these, these emails to the user themselves, right? They're showing interest, uh, you know, they're showing interest in a product or a service. And then their ads, for example, could be tailored to them. Now, with these settings off, it'll be interesting uh, studies in the future showing, you know, how the end recipient or users are when they're search, searching the web and they're seeing just these random advertisements pop up that may, they might have no interest in. So it's going to be interesting uh, to see. But, you know, I, I, I think, yes, others will follow suit almost like we've gone back to the before the time this technology was actually created. Um, yes, absolutely. So Nikki, uh, another question perhaps for you. What's a good example of A-B testing to test click-through rate? Right, so yeah, I gave a couple of examples, but I think probably the best one really would be, and the simplest one to do is to um, uh, do uh, chest your call to action so the button on your email or perhaps if you're using an image as that um, to do a couple of variables on that to see okay does this wording work better than this wording and then you can determine if you've got that very one that very simple change across both tests you can then quite clearly see um, which one is working better than the other that's just one example um, again another one could be image so perhaps you have a subscriber list that they are, um, you know, people that are based locally in a drive drive market and they travel with families. So that's the kind of list that you've created in your database. Maybe you want to try two different images in the campaign. So perhaps you could try an image that is very family orientated and um, uh, could be quite compelling if you've got like small kids showing them playing in a local area or maybe you can have something else that is maybe more about the landscape or um, like your swimming pool something like that trying two different images is another great way to see okay well what are actually our audience compelled to click on um, as opposed to um, as opposed to not great so uh, another question here, um, what are some good examples of email marketing personalization? Uh, maybe Nikki, that follows on from your previous uh, answer too. Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, so I would say that personalization, you can kind of, you, it's, it's an infinite number of things that you could do, but if you are starting out in that and you're not quite sure where to start, um, your email marketing tool that you use or CRM will most likely have the ability to add something called dynamic content, which basically you can determine, you can say, okay, well, if the information in this for this subscriber is this, then show this information. So again, in that same example of the um, list that you've got for families um, in a drive-by market, you perhaps could perhaps show um, a certain piece of information in an image for those that are interested in golf. Maybe the dad's interested in golf or something and they want to do family golf vacation. You could have something appear if they're actually more interested in outdoor adventures. And then you can change the image and the text to reflect those two separate things. It's all in one email, um, but you put those variables in within the HTML, within the code of the email to make sure that what displays for the reader is actually the thing that's most relevant to them. So that's one way of doing it. If you want to go a little bit simpler, um, which again, dynamic content shouldn't be too challenging. It just requires the setup in the beginning. Um, but 
uh, you can always try kind of personalization in subject lines um, and using compelling um, messaging there to grab someone's attention and make that note stand out. Um, those are just a couple of ways you could you could get started with that. So it really is taking the personalization of what we do in property, uh, putting it into email and getting as much personalization out to our, our current, our future and our past uh, guests as we can uh, through email communication. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's uh, about all we've got time for today, unfortunately. And the questions that we haven't got time uh, got to today, we'll follow up with email. Uh, so now it's time to wrap up. It was great to see so many people in the audience today. I'd love to give a special thanks to our panelists, Nikki and Robert, for your insights on the impacts and the opportunities these changes provide hoteliers around the globe. If you're interested in any further topics or Sendine solutions, resources, and their infographics, please contact the Sendine team or visit sendine.com. So thanks to all of you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes.